yes, yes. Some of us like our music hot. like our music sweet. Some people prefer the classics. Others would rather hear the old songs. Others just don't like music. It is, as we say, a matter of taste, a matter of personal preferences, individual likes and dislikes that all of us have, not only for music, but for almost everything else in this world of ours. Now, take clothes, for example. A man's taste might dictate dark colors, simple patterns, or it may run to drape shapes, stuff cuffs, and reed pleats. And then, ladies' hats. This is a tailored model. Now this, well, if she puts it on her head, it's a hat. It's a hat. Choice of reading, too, is a matter of taste. Love and romance rate high with some people, while others prefer to curdle up with a mystery. Personal preference in flavors of food and drink is a matter of taste, in more ways than one. Caviar, to some, is the food of the angels. Yet to others, it's nothing but marinated buckshot. So it goes. Flavors that appeal to some people will often be unappetizing to others. But there are some flavors that almost everyone likes. And one of these is lemon. Yes, most everyone likes lemon. We use its juice for flavoring to add piquancy to other flavors. On salads, on shrimp and most all seafood cocktails, in pies, cakes, and different desserts. We use it on cantaloupe and other fruit. Yes, for its own sake, and as a compliment to other flavors. Most everyone enjoys the fresh, clean taste of lemon. So doubtless it has been ever since man first sampled the sun-colored fruit. So it was, too, during the 1920s when a soft drink company, planning a new carbonated beverage, made a study of flavors most appealing to the American palate. Lemon, one of the first fruit flavors ever used in carbonated water, was one of the most popular of all. Yet, strangely enough, though hundreds of lemon-flavored drinks were on the market at that time, no one brand had widespread distribution, much less national popularity. Each was different, different in sweetness, sourness, and in color. There was no standard of taste. In spite of these facts, or more likely because of them, the company decided to make lemon the basic flavor of their new drink. From 1925 through 1927, the desired characteristics of the drink were worked out. 
and in 1928, experts set out to perfect a formula for a lemon drink that would succeed where others failed. A lemon drink with just enough lime flavoring added for extra piquancy and delicate taste appeal. A drink that would be good, that would be wholesome, that would be more than just another pop. Selected bottlers located across the country, about a dozen in all, worked right along in these experiments. They made up the drinks, distributed them in their territories, invited criticism from both dealers and public alike, and reported results to the company. In this way, formula after formula was made up, tried out, and discarded. Until finally, the verdict was unanimous. The new drink was good. It was right. Brisk, clean tasting, distinctive in flavor, outstanding in quality. Yes, sir, this was the drink destined to sweep the continent as America's Fresh Up Drink. Introduced in St. Louis, Missouri, during the darkest years of the Great Depression, the new drink sold. Proud of their product and pledged to maintain topmost quality of its flavor and goodness, your local 7-Up bottler, like John Hunter here, is always happy to welcome you to his plant where you can be sure he will make your visit an interesting as well as a pleasant one. There you are, Mr. White. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks. <clears throat> Jackie, not so fast. Oh, that's all right, Mrs. White. Let him drink all he wants. It's good for him. But sip it, Jackie. It tastes better that way. You know, we're mighty proud of what goes into our drink. In fact, we list the ingredients right on the label. Carbonated water, sugar, citric acid, lithium and soda citrates, flavor derived from lemon and lime oils. Carbonated water, of course, is water that has been charged with carbon dioxide gas. This is the same gas that forms when baking powder or yeast is added to cake dough and causes it to rise. It's the same gas that flowers and trees and all plant life live on. In fact, life on this earth would be impossible without it. The gas in carbonated water is held, imprisoned, you might say, in the liquid. Released, it rises to the surface quickly and easily in clouds of tiny bubbles. Forcing these same bubbles into the water for our drink is something else again. It's a highly complicated business. But let me explain the principle to you briefly. Here we have the water in a tank. Above the water, we introduce the carbon dioxide gas. Rushing into the tank under pressure, the bubbles fill the empty space and then begin to penetrate the water until pretty soon the surface is crowded with it. As more bubbles enter the water, this crowding at the surface makes it extremely difficult for the rest of the bubbles to force their way through. And this, of course, makes further penetration a relatively slow process. That's not so good. So, to overcome this, we simply spread out the same amount of water so that the surface area is increased and new surfaces are exposed. Then there's less crowding. And because the bubbles don't have to penetrate so far into the water, the saturation point is reached in a much shorter space of time. That's a very simplified explanation of the principle, of course, but you get the idea. Expose the greatest possible area of water to the gas so that more gas gets absorbed. In the days before scientific carbonation, pop went But nowadays, it's done in complex machinery modern and fully enclosed, so that our drink holds its carbonation, its life and sparkle. Right down to the last sip. Here, have another, Jackie. Thanks. Naturally, the water we use is as fresh and sanitary as the water you drink at home. But still, it isn't good enough. But let me show you what I mean. 
Let's go into the plant. Water, as we ordinarily think of it, has a lot of other things in it. Minerals, for example, which we must remove or neutralize. So we run it through superfine filters, through softening and treating processes, and through carbon absorbers. Yes, careful and constant study of the water, a lot of expensive equipment and many time-consuming processes are involved before it's ready for our drink. Our next ingredient is mighty important to flavor, and that's good, pure sugar. Sugar so pure that it imparts no taste other than sweetness. Here in the syrup room or kitchen, you'll find in every bottling plant, the sugar is dissolved in water to make a simple syrup. And this in turn is mixed and blended with other ingredients in exacting proportions, according to exacting standards. From citrus fruits, such as lemons and limes, comes another ingredient you'll find on the label. This is a mild acid, citric acid it's called, which accounts for their tartness of taste. Citric acid is used in a great number of food products today to point up flavor, make them tastier and more appetizing, and is part of the Army's famous K ration. To smooth and mellow the acid sharpness in our drink, we add a combination of mineral salts, lithium and sodium citrates. They also preserve the delicate quality of the lemon-lime flavor. They help keep it as dainty and fresh as it is in the bottling line. Last in our label's list of ingredients, but definitely first in importance, are flavors derived from lemon and lime oil. They provide the basic flavor of our drink. If you've ever squeezed the peel of a lemon or lime, you're bound to have noticed the tiny globules of liquid that appeared on the surface. This is a fragrant oil placed in the peel by nature, the true essence of the fruit's characteristic flavor as we know it. Because this oil flavor actually flavors the pulp and juices as the fruit ripens. Its quality depends naturally on the climate and condition of the tree. And when you consider the tiny amount of oil that can be squeezed from a single lemon or lime, you can imagine how many thousands we need to fill just one of these three-gallon drums. Even so, the highly concentrated flavor in this oil still isn't good enough for us. By means of an exclusive process, we super refine each three gallon drum full of oil until we have only a few ounces of flavoring. The very essence of utmost richness and purity. Coming into the bottling plant now, one of the first and certainly one of the most interesting pieces of equipment is the bottle washing machine. It gets bottles so clean and sterile they could be used for a baby's formula. After washing comes inspection. Every single bottle is inspected by an expert through a giant magnifying glass for flaws or damage. This water cooling machinery is one part of the complex business of scientific carbonation we talked about a little earlier. It lowers the temperature of the filtered water to the point necessary for really good carbonation. From here, the Cooled water goes right into this carbonator, which, inside its sanitary covering, forces the tiny gas bubbles into the liquid, where they're kept till you take your first sip of your fresh up drink. And finally, there's the syruper and filler that measures the amount of syrup and water that goes into each bottle with the accuracy of a chemist making up a prescription. The rest of our job is comparatively simple. We load the bottles on trucks and deliver them to convenient locations where the ultimate consumer can get it when he wants it. 
I'm amazed, Mr. Hunter. Your bottling plant's as clean as my own kitchen. I really mean it. Thank you, Mrs. White. We honestly try to keep it up to just that standard. And speaking of kitchens, here's an interesting recipe book that'll show you a lot of different ways to use 7-Up at home. For instance, pour it over any kind of fish during baking or broiling. It not only reduces cooking odor, but enhances the flavor as well. Ice cream in a tall glass with 7-Up added makes a quick, delicious dessert. And used instead of water for basting, it makes baked ham or roast chicken tastier than you'd ever think possible. Here's something new to try, a 7-Up milk cocktail. 7-Up and milk, half and half. It makes a delicious food drink for children who won't drink milk. And most adults like its decidedly different flavor. And here's an idea. 7-Up ice cubes. For one thing, they make a glass of iced tea taste better. Give it a distinctive and added flavor that you'll thoroughly enjoy. Breakfast appetizers. 7-Up and grape or pineapple juice, half and half. And they are real good. Mmm. You know, I can't wait to try some of these recipes. I'll have the ham. I'll have mine with ice cream tonight, huh, Mom? Looks like you started something, Mr. Hunter. Yes. From the time 7-Up was first introduced in St. Louis, its popularity has grown from year to year among all kinds of people. The fishermen in Maine and New England. The lumberjack out in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest. The child in Atlanta and down to the deep south. The cowboy and ranchman in the western cattle country. Debutantes in the smart places. Movie stars and extras working in Hollywood studios. Seven Up is liked by everyone. Those who seek the maximum value for their money and by those who are accustomed to the best and who get it, regardless of cost. Yes, regardless of taste, everyone likes 7-Up. And don't forget, you've always a standing invitation to visit your local 7-Up bottler. Come out and visit us. We think you'll enjoy it.